out with a quote. Um, I'm gonna, it's a pretty lengthy quote, but I want you to think about you know, who potentially said this or wrote this. This is from an essay. Uh, what is the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is, his, what is his worldly God? Money. What in itself is the basis of the Jewish religion? Practical need, egoism. The God of practical need and self-interest is money. Money is the jealous God of Israel, in face of which no other God may exist. Money degrades all the gods of man and turns them into commodities. Money is the universal, self-established value of all things. It has therefore robbed the whole world, both the world of men and nature, of its specific value. Money is the estranged essence of man's work and man's existence, and this alien essence dominates him, and he worships it. The God of the Jews has become secularized and has become the God of the world. The Bill of Exchange is the real God of the Jew. The chimerical nationality of the Jew is the nationality of the merchant, of the man of money in general. Pretty nasty stuff. And who wrote it? Anybody? Hitler. Hitler, all right. Karl Marx. This is straight out of Karl Marx, who indeed devoted an entire essay to this topic. And the essay was titled on the question of the Jew, uh, on the Jewish question, sorry, on the Jewish question, which was a, uh, there was a series of essays on the Jewish question in the mid-19th century that various intellectuals commented on, and this was Karl Marx's contribution to that uh, analysis. Karl Marx, of course, was Jewish, technically, by uh, birth. And this is his view of the Jew. The Jew is self-interested. The Jew is egoistic. The Jew is about money. The Jew is a merchant. In other words, the Jew is a capitalist. And you know Karl Marx's view of capitalism, and therefore you know Karl Marx's view of the Jew. For Marx even says it in the quote, one of the horrific things Jews have done, indeed, is that they have spread this word among the Christian nations. So that the whole world now worships money. In other words, it is the Jew that has brought capitalism to the world and has distorted the world. And he says, in the, in later in the essay, he says, the solution to the Jewish problem, and he says the Jewish problem is not about the Jews. The Jewish problem now is about pretty much all of Europe. Because the problem is not a Jewish problem. The problem is a money problem. The problem is capitalism. And the problem can only be solved if the Jew stops being a Jew. And more importantly, if Christians stop being Jews. In other words, if the world stops worshipping money, stops worshipping capitalism, stops being a merchant society abandons capitalism. So for him, for Karl Marx, the man who the left, you know, everywhere in the world worships, for Karl Marx, you could not separate capitalism from the Jewish people. Those two were interlinked, and the hatred of both was connected. And I think this is a, this is a feature of, of the West, uh, you know, not just of the left, but it dominated in the mid-19th century as capitalism is starting to dominate Europe as uh, production, trade, cities are starting to dominate. There's more and more feeling of alienation by those who kind of miss the traditions of the past. The agrarian life, life in the countryside, who resent the idea of cities and money and wealth creation 
and dominance. And you see this both on the left and on the right. Left is the Marxism, right is kind of the conservatism, particularly in places like Germany, where they write long odes to the wonders of agrarian life and farming and how life used to be. And like, whenever there's massive change, whenever there's, uh, the, the, there's angst, there's alienation, there is a feeling of, you know, things are out of control, things are happening that we can't hold on to. People always look to blame it on someone. They always look for a scapegoat. They always look for someone on the outside who they can attribute everything that's happening around them that is so scary onto. And in Europe, there's a long tradition of who those outsiders are going to be. And in the case of the 19th century, the outsider was the Jew. The Jew was in the cities. They were assimilating in society. They were kind of scary. They weren't easy to identify anymore. Historically, the Jew could be easily identified. They lived in their own villages. They lived in their own ghetto. They wore different clothes. But suddenly, they were becoming part of European society. And they were dominant in the banking industry. They were dominant in what everybody viewed as the, 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 the capitalist world. And you always want to look at an outsider. The Jew is an outsider. You want to look at somebody who's changing things, who's shaking things up. That's exactly what they were doing. Or at least that's the perception of what they were doing. And you never want to blame your own people, right? Tribalism works very effectively if we can blame others for our own problems. We never want to blame ourselves for those problems. So the Jew became the scapegoat for this rise of capitalism, both in Marx's mind and in the right's mind, in the mind of the conservative right all over, all over Europe. And you see it, to a large extent, again today, with a lot of angst, alienation, concern, globalization, immigration. Who gets blamed for all this? Well, in different countries, we choose different others to blame for it. But somehow, Jews are always part of that mix. There were synagogue shootings in the United States recently, in Pittsburgh and then in California. And what did the guy blame the Jews for there in the shooting in the synagogue? They're behind all these Mexican immigrants. They're bringing them in. They're helping them come into the country. They're behind globalization. Because another thing that Jews are always associate with, one is obviously capitalism, but the other, and we'll get to why that is and what the historical origins of that is, the other is globalism. You know the term globalism now, this dirty word, globalist. I, I, I get called that all the time, and I relish it because I indeed am a globalist. Uh, now, they associate globalism with, the, the, the word, the term now is associated with a one world government and, you know, the globalists want one world government and no borders and everybody moving all over the place. And what is, what have Jews been? You know, my, you know uh, my family, my kids are fourth generation, fourth generation, born on a different continent. Fourth generation born on a different continent. My, uh, you know, my kids were born in America, North America. I was born in Asia, Israel. My parents were born in Africa, South Africa. And their parents were born in Northern Europe, in Lithuania. Four generations, four continents. What did the Jews come to symbolize for hundreds of years? Migrants. They don't have a home. They spread all over the world. And they are successful all over the world. And they have this interest in, I don't know, one world government, I guess, because they have branches everywhere. It's easy to see. It's easy to associate with this with a conspiracy because here they are. They're everywhere. And they dominate everywhere. So today, both on the right and the left, on the right, it's more... It's definitely capitalism, we'll get to that. But it's also this globalism, this, this idea of, and again, you know, I, I relish the term globalist because I, I'm a big believer in trade, in global trade, in global migration, and you know, I'm a big believer in free movement of people. Not a big believer in one world government, 
But n that doesn't stop anybody from calling me what they want to call me. Um, but that, that whole idea of freedom is now something that the right condemns, particularly in the United States. And on the left, Jews associated with, again, capitalism. And Israel, and we'll talk about why they hate Israel. That's on the left. But both left and right are going back to hating the Jew, a symbol of something they despise even more. So why this link between Jews and money, between Jews and banking, between Jews and capitalism? Well, there's a real long history, and you can see the history in, in some of the great artworks of, of Western civilization. You know, go back to Dante. I don't know if anybody's read Dante's Inferno. But in Dante's Inferno, the moneylender, right, the moneylender, is in the seventh rung of hell, and he's got a big bag of money, you know, around his neck, and because it's heavy, it's dragging him down towards the fire, right, to really get burnt. It's that money is evil, money is destructive, and who is the honey lender? He is a Jew. It's obvious. Right? Shakespeare, of course, immortal, you know, creates this amazing character in The Merchant of Venice of Shylock. Shakespeare had never met a Jew, right? Because Jews were banned from England for 200 years. There were no Jews in England. During Shakespearean times, there were no Jews in England. But he creates this moneylender. Shylock, who is, you know, depending on who's depicting it in a particular frame of the production, is basically the bad guy of the play. He's greedy. He wants his money. He dares. He dares as the Christian. There's a Christian um, hero of the play, and the Christian kind of condemns Shylock. What, 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 you know, what's so bad about Shylock? Shylock loans money, and what does he expect in return? What's that? Income, interest. He actually wants to get interest on his loans. The Christian says, when somebody needs money, I just lend them money. I don't expect anything in return. I just make a loan, no interest. And this goes back to this idea that in Christianity, interest, charging interest, which was called usury historically, any interest was called usury, was banned. It was wrong to charge interest on a loan, going back to the beginning of Christianity. And this is, there's a passage in the Old Testament where God says to the Jews, he says, you cannot charge interest on a loan from your brother. From a stranger, that's okay. Now, the way you interpret that is what, is, what does it mean to be a brother in Judaism? It means from other Jews. So the prohibition originally was, you cannot charge interest from other Jews, but you can charge interest from non-Jews. Now comes Christianity, and Christianity, who is your brother? Who is your brother under Christianity? Well, everybody. Christianity is a universal religion. Judaism is a very, you know, exclusive religion. It's a very tribal religion. Christianity is a universal religion. So if everybody's your brother, who can you charge interest from? Nobody. And indeed, interest, charging interest on a loan, is a mortal sin. This is why the moneylender in Dante is in the seventh rung of hell. You go to hell for charging interest. So, it's only in the late 19th century that the Catholic Church say, okay, charging interest is okay. It's just excess interest. Now they call that usury, which is not good. But you can charge. Only in the late 19th century did they acknowledge this. Now, you know, if you study history, you'll find that the Catholic Church was lending money all over the place and charging interest. Indeed, they would often burn the usuries in different towns as a form of getting rid of the competition so that they could dominate the, uh, the banking trade. But they always did it in a way that wasn't explicitly interest. So there are all kinds of, you know, you know Islamic banking today? I don't know if you're familiar with Islamic banking. Uh, Islam, you're not allowed to charge interest on loans either. And, and they still stick to it. What's that? 
Christianity. It's a sin to charge. Yeah, it's a, it's a sin to charge interest, just like in Christianity. So what the Islamic banks do is they don't, they don't charge you interest. You get a loan, they don't charge you interest. But they take a dividend. <laughs> or they take a percentage of your business. So, you know, they find a way to get the interest, but they don't call it interest. And they're very successful Islamic banks out there. That, but, but it's all, and, and the Catholic Church did exactly the same thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Monks used to be some of the biggest money lenders, but they never called it interest. They always took a stake in your business or something like that. The Medici Bank never actually charged interest. They charged an interest without calling it an interest. They found a different way to get around the prohibition. So who did do most of the straight-up banking during the time when it was banned on the Christians? Well, the Jews did. And the Jews did it because, one, there were very few professions open to them. They weren't allowed to own land in many places. They weren't allowed to, 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 to engage in many of the professions available to most people in, in, you know, in, the, uh, in much of the period after the fall of the Roman Empire. And use it, what's that? Yeah, and university was very limited. Uh, but, you know, very few people went to university until very late, right? I mean, remember, this is agrarian society. This is a, up until the end of the 18th century, very few people went to universities. It was very exclusive, and it was primarily religious studies that you studied in university. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, actually a liberal, a, a liberal curriculum. So they were limited to this, to few professions. But the real reason they did usury is because they were allowed to. And the Christians recognized that they were allowed to. So Jews were allowed to charge interest from non-Jews. So they did it. Now, think of what it must have been like for a Christian to go to a Jew to borrow money and then pay them interest. According to the Christian, these people are committing a mortal sin. This is really evil of them. But we need the money, so we have to go to them and ask. And then we have to pay them back interest. I mean, all of us, none of us like paying interest on our loans, although I, I kind of think it's cool, but, you know, because I, I, like, I like the fact that I can get a loan and I can, uh, you know, transact. Well, most people resent it. Now, on top of that, you resent it doubly because in your book, the New Testament, it says it's a, it's a mortal sin. By your interpretation, what they're doing is wrong. Because according to Christianity, they should be giving you a loan and charging what for it? Zero. Ask the Christian in the Merchant of Venice. It's exactly what he says. It's exactly what he argues. And you can see the buildup of resentment towards the Jewish moneylender who's making money, getting rich, off of Christians by committing a sin that's going to put him in hell. Seventh rung, to be exact. Now, this is not the only source of anti-Semitism, to be sure, but it's a big one. It's a big one. And it builds over time. And as more economic activity is engaged in, the more you need loans, the more finance becomes more and more important. And the more the Jews are involved in that, and the more the resentment against them occurs. And think again about this idea of globalism. The Jews are not just in one place. They have branches all over the place. They build up banking empires, whether it's the Rothschilds or others. They now have branches all over Europe. They're not affiliated with one particular country. Are the Rothschilds an English bank or a French bank? It's not clear. Where are the alliances? Do they have any other than to themselves and to making money? And now you can see why Marx's quote Makes sense, in a sense, right? Why that's what we're seeing. That's what he's seeing. Jews were at the heart of the world of finance, at the heart of the world of capitalism during the 19th century. So if you resent capitalism, and you look at who the capitalists are and who's kind of driving this, well, they are Jews everywhere you look. And the hatred is combined. So from very early on, the Christian world resents the idea of the money lender. You know, uh, uh, often Jews are, are killed because they are the money lenders. You know, if you're, a, uh, if you're an aristocrat and, or, uh, uh, and you've borrowed a lot of money, 
from the local money lender and you can't repay your debts, what's one solution to that? Well, you organize a little pogrom and you go kill them. And uh, you, you happen to burn all the books where the debts are listed at the same time. There's no cloud, there's no backups. And now, whoops, all your debts are gone. And it had nothing to do with that because it was just a populist revolt against those evil Jews. But again, in history, you can find occasion after occasion where the guy who borrowed the money manages to wipe out all the remnants of the people who actually lent him the money. So both on the right and on the left, the, the kind of conservative right that in the 19th century resented the rise of capitalism and the Marxist left that resented the rise of capitalism. They believed capitalism was alienating for two different reasons. The left, because of, you know, the manual labor was being exploited. The right, because it was overturning traditional values. Both sides linked the rise of capitalism to this idea of Judaism. Deeper than that, and you see that in the quote I gave you from Marx. What does Marx link the Jew to? Not just to money. What else does he link him to? He links him to self-interest. I mean, in the essay, over and over and over again, Marx says the Jew is self-interested. The Jew is an egoist. And we live in a culture in which self-interest and egoism is what? Good? Is that a compliment? We live in a culture, we live in a world, we live in a Christian world to a large extent, a, a world that is dominated by Christian morality, in which what is a view of egoism and self-interest? Well, we resent it. It's, that's the essence of immorality. It's the essence of corruption. To be self-interested is to be immoral, almost by definition. We're all taught, Christian and Jew and every other person, right? We're all taught that the essence of morality is what? Is to be self-less. Think of yourself last. I mean, nobility, virtue, morality, being a good person in our world means what? Means self-sacrifice. It means to live for the sake of others. That is the, you know, that is the essence of the moral code in which we live. Augustine Comte and Kant, Immanuel Kant, both argued that morality, essential of morality is to take care of others without thinking of oneself. And if you think of your own interests while taking care of others, it doesn't count as moral. It doesn't count as moral. You have to do it purely out of a sense of altruism, purely out of a sense of love for the other, purely out of a sense of selflessness. To any extent that you bring in self, to that extent, your action is immoral. Now, it's true that nobody actually holds that idea. Nobody actually thinks, yeah, I shouldn't think of myself at all. I should just take care of others. Nobody actually lives that, because if we did, we would all die. We couldn't survive that way. But it is true that in a sense, in our moral DNA, at the core of what we view as moral in our culture, is this view of selflessness, is this view of morality, is this view that altruism is what makes us good. And that fundamentally self-interest is bad. I mean, in my view, in Ayn Rand's view, this is why people hate capitalism so much. Because capitalism, whether we like it or not, I like it, but is about self-interest. Nobody goes into capitalism for the sake of humanity. It's not about loving your neighbor. It's about what? What is capitalism about? Trade. Well, trade is an outcome of what? Well, it's an outcome of production on the one side, which is done for the sake of what? Profit. Making money, self-interest, fun, enjoying the productive process. Right? But it's done for self-interest. And of course, the other side of trade is what? One is production, the other side of trade is what? Consumption. Now, I know all of you consume out of love for your fellow man. 
because you want to make sure people have jobs. You know, that's why you go to the mall. And you have all bought into the Keynesian theory that consumption drives the economy. So you want to make sure the British economy keeps on chugging along. So you go and spend your money in the mall. Now, luckily, nobody does that. Luckily, we all go to consume. Why? To try to make our own lives better. So essentially, capitalism is self-interest. Essentially, capitalism is about self-interest. And self-interest is denounced, rejected as evil. Altruism, selflessness, is the ideal of morality. And capitalism ain't it. Capitalism is not about selflessness. It's not about altruism. It's not about helping people. People are better off as an outcome of capitalism. But they're better off because of their self-interest. Because they're pursuing their self-interest. Not because of some altruistic giving. Altruistic, you know. I mean, even charity under capitalism, which is a big part, you know, a significant part of capitalism, there is charity. I mean, as a, the amount of help that it get, provides people, it's insignificant as compared to trade, production, consumption, actual economic activity. China did not become relatively wealthy. You're not supposed to use China these days, I guess. But relatively wealthy because of charity, but because they embraced a little bit of capitalism, a little bit of self-interest, a little bit of freedom. America didn't become, you know, I, I always tell my audiences in America, in 1776, you guys didn't care enough about, about these third-rate insignificant colonies over there to really fight a war. That's why we won. But it was a third-rate colony. And then within 140 you know, years, it was the most powerful economy in the world because of community service and charity. Right? No, because of capitalism, because of self-interest, because of people pursuing their wealth. People trying to make money. Okay. You demonstrate it in, in human terms in your novel Atlas Shrug. And let me start by quoting from a review of this novel Atlas Shrug that appeared in Newsweek. It said that you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will. Other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. I agree with the facts, but not the estimates of this criticism. Namely, if I am challenging the base of all these institutions, I'm challenging the moral code of altruism, the precept that man's moral duty is to live for others, that man must sacrifice himself to others, which is the present day morality. What do you Since mean by I, sacrifice himself for others? This now we're moment, getting to the point. One moment. Since I'm challenging the base, I necessarily would challenge the institutions you named, which are a result of that morality. All right. And now what is self-sacrifice? Yes, what is self-sacrifice? You say that you do not like the altruism by which we live. You, you like a certain kind of Ayn Randist selfishness. I uh, would say that I don't like is too weak a word. I consider it evil, and uh, self-sacrifice is the precept that man needs to serve others in order to justify his existence, that his moral duty is to serve others. That is what most people believe today. Well, yes, we're taught to feel concerned for our fellow man, to feel responsible for his welfare, to feel that we are, as religious people uh, might put it, children under God and responsible one for the other. Now, why do you rebel? What's wrong with this philosophy? But that is what, uh, in fact, makes man a sacrificial animal. That man must work for others, concern himself with others, or be responsible for them. That is the role of a sacrificial object. I say that man is entitled to his own happiness and that he must achieve it himself. But that he cannot demand that others give up their lives to make him happy. I and read. nor should he wish to sacrifice himself for the happiness of others. I hold that man should have self-esteem. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, 
please take this opportunity. Go to youronbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...